Good evening. Welcome to the Leaders' Debate. Over the next hour, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition will debate significant issues raised in this election campaign. A time allowance has been allocated for discussion of each issue, but there is no provision for equal time in this programme. It is a debate, and it's up to Mr Longy and Mr Bolger to present themselves and challenge each other as they see fit. One exception to that point, at the beginning of each specific topic, each leader does have the right to make a concise, uninterrupted statement outlining his party's policy on that particular issue. And finally, if there are significant omissions or contradictions in the course of this debate, I'll be putting follow-up questions or asking for explanations. The first issue of this debate, credibility. And by the toss of a coin, that issue is addressed first to Mr Longy. Prime Minister, when people charge that you lack credibility, they cite things such as your back down on the French agents, the broken promise on superannuation, substantially modified position on Fiji, the revelation of the existence of a hidden agenda in 1984, and above all, I think, holding out hope continually of lowered inflation and interest rates that simply don't eventuate. Well, let's go back to what credibility is about. Credibility is about people being able to judge me and the government on the basis of performance and promise, and not on the basis of some whole series of wild promises wild allegations and contradictory policy statements that our opponents are coming up with. Now, all those things that you outlined, let's go back to the French agents. Our opponents said we've been too easy on them. No, Prime Minister, you backed down, you buckled. You wanted us, you said you they wanted were us going to, to stay in New Zealand and you buckled. Seconds, all right, we, we have promised each leader is, a 30 second. I think you fact, had your 30 seconds. No, Mr. Pettigrew. Let us come to Mr. Bolger. I'd, I'd like to say well, some uh, of the things that undermine his credibility and then let's throw it open. You are the man who can both float a dollar and devalue it substantially at one and the same time. You can respect neither confirm nor deny and, and yet still keep nuclear ships out. You can be a party to uh, think big, the wage price freeze, and then suddenly convert to the free market. And you can lower the tone of this election cam campaign by referring to your opponent as an arrogant Humpty Dumpty. Now, all of that does subvert credibility, doesn't it? Well, I don't accept your first proposition that uh, we're going to float the dollar and devalue it. That is not the National Party's policy, and that's been made very, very clear. Substantial in terms, devaluation. In terms, that was one member of the team, not the National Party's policy. It was not contradicted. It was contradicted. I said very precisely that we would continue to float the dollar, that we would not intervene on the value of the dollar, other than by balancing economic policies, which would get us a realistic value to the New Zealand dollar. But let's pick up one or two of the other issues. You talked about the major projects. I believe they were worthwhile, have been worthwhile for New Zealand, and given the Gulf oil crisis at the moment, have shown to be so. The other question is the tone of the debate in the election campaign. I think the election campaign has been relatively dull by comparison with other election campaigns. And one of the reasons is the Prime Minister is not entering into the debate. I mean, he doesn't have meetings, so how can we have a debate in this election campaign. Well, we have lots of meetings, and uh, one of the interesting things about the campaign is credibility. The leader of the opposition said, I campaigned in New Plymouth in a Porsche. He repeated it. He was wrong. He knew he was wrong. He kept repeating it. I have never been in a Porsche. I have seen a couple of them. I don't think I could get in them. Well, that's the big deal of the campaign. No, it, it isn't, that, but it goes that, to your credibility. That you, that you had a the leader Porsche, of the opposition that was you the had person a Porsche who in New told Plymouth. the National Business Review on the 19th of July that he was 100% sure that New Zealand would be back in ANZUS. And he told the Evening Post on the 24th of July that he could give no reassurance. I now, said we'll five days, a total turnaround. He didn't do an about-face on nuclear ships. He did a two-face on nuclear ships. No, Prime Minister, you've got the problem with right. the whole of the ANZUS debate because you are the one who has taken New Zealand out of ANZUS. The policy that I've announced, and we'll come to this later and in detail, you are determined the policy to bring that I've announced back to New Zealand. is the you policy that will that. get New Zealand back into ANZUS, will get back into ANZUS and have nuclear on a neither confirmed nor deny basis, and we will not have nuclear weapons in New Zealand, Prime Minister. You are prepared to trust the United States on the military aircraft coming into Harewood, you rewrote your own law to permit that to happen on an either confirmed or denied basis, Prime Minister. Now, you have this uh, strange difference that you can trust a country on one vessel and you can't trust them on the other. That's because I can tell the difference between a cargo plane going to a nuclear-free Antarctic and a nuclear-free New Zealand. What about going to the, the bases in Australia? A, a ship. Can I tell you, Mr Bolger, can I tell you that you know perfectly well that you will have nuclear weapons in New Zealand from time to time if you have that policy. 
because we have the word of the most honourable member of an administration that has never, ever wavered in his word. And his word was that if those vessels come to New Zealand, they will not might from time to time be nuclear Your armed. The problem with that statement, Prime Minister, and you've made it many, many times, is the uh, statement out of the State Department in Washington during this election campaign that your statement, your statement, Prime Minister, is not in accordance no, with the facts. No, that they has did come, not say that at That has come from Washington no, during the course of this election it campaign. It has not, but you know and it. It, it has so, and you know it, no. Prime Minister, and therefore your statement, sir, doesn't stand up. Are there any threads to this credibility yes, issue that is. you the wish to touch is, on? The fact they can see it. me, and they can judge me, and they can judge this government. But the opposition have, are into their fifth economic policy, and two of them are still current. They changed their nuclear policy. When law and order, they thought they could get on the bandwagon, appeal to the swinging voter. They actually came up just after they'd released their law and order policy with a policy for a referendum on hanging, and the leader of the opposition couldn't make up his mind With which way question. he'd jump, and he wouldn't make up his mind which way he'd jump, and he bound that his party wouldn't be bound by the referendum. The question of credibility relates, way, relates to the commitments of the Prime Minister before the last election not to touch superannuation, and he did. His bound and pledge to New Zealanders time and again he wouldn't let the French agents go, and he did. His commitment to the New Zealand electorate that New Zealand would stay in ANZUS and we're out. His commitment, his commitment to get people into work, and we've got record unemployment. No, you you his are. commitment to get the interest rates and the inflation rate down, and they're at record levels. The list could go on, Mr. Perigo, regarding the Prime Minister's credibility. He simply hasn't been able to deliver on a single commitment he's made, not on the whole lot, just on a single Can commitment. Can I take that we'll, up, no, Mr. We'll Perigo? Come back no, to, no, that's we, important we'll come back for him to a lot not of to be able to say that, because we, we he has just accused me of honouring an anti-nuclear promise. Prime Minister. He accuses me of honouring it, and then he says, I never honoured a promise. You yes, said Prime Minister, we'll come back. Gentlemen, <laughs> we will come back to the nuclear policy, I promise you. <laughs> but probably the key substantive indicator as to credibility in this election is the state of the economy and each party's economic policy. After three years of breathtaking change, some say it's happened too quickly, some say it's had to happen at that pace, some say it shouldn't have happened at all. And so we turn to the economy now with a basic position statement from each of the leaders. Mr Bolger first. Well, the economy clearly is in a mess. Our overseas borrowing puts New Zealand second only to Chile in the international climate. The question of our interest rates, our inflation rate, our record unemployment, the lack of investment, the decline in the manufacturing and the farming sector all demonstrate that what's happened in the last three years isn't working. What we're saying is very precise, that you must get the size of the state down, you must control the demands of the state on the economy. There has to be a balance in monetary and fiscal policy. We've got the nonsense in New Zealand, allegedly a tight monetary policy. Private credit grew by 88% at the same time the consumer price increase was 48% and we have to have real reform of our labour laws and practice in New Zealand. Unless well, we do Mr. all of those three, Mr. we're going to continue down the track we're going now. Go. I suggest to you that that is probably a most graphic description of what the National Party offers this election. A man pretending to be a motor mechanic, he can take the engine to bits, but he has no idea how to put it together again. Analysis, whoa, Jer Jeremiah, come down from the mountain. Preaching doom, sackcloth and ashes. No, a country is. which had to turn round. A country which in July 1984 had been brought to its knees by a cabinet, seven of whom are on your front bench right now. And that challenge to this government caused pain, it caused disruption. We have disturbed privilege in every section of our society. But we never promised it would be done in three years, and we never promised oh, it yes, would be did. easy. Yes, and did. your 1984 election advertising reproduced Peter Nielsen's statement that it would take six years to turn unemployment around. And you published that statement, but and you can't worse, deny Prime it Minister. now. Unemployment's Unemployment going up. has not reached the level it did it with special work up. when you were the Minister of Labour. No, but When it's a you were the Minister of Labour, you promised in a cynical, desperately cynical play on people's aspirations and emotions. No. You promised 410,000 jobs, and when you were asked to cost them, you couldn't. Well, that's not true, of course, Prime Minister. We went through the detail of where those jobs were going to come from. And where did they go? From.
they were going to come out of growth in the manufacturing ah, sector, which was growing Not at that time. They <laughs> identified 100,000 additional yeah. jobs out of manufacturing. Yeah. The agricultural, horticultural, land-based industries yeah. identified 160,000 jobs over the same decade. So, so it all happened, what, but no one What has about. happened, of course, <laughs> is you have turned the economy down, Prime Minister. Your government has produced the record interest rates and the record inflation rates. This morning's, this morning's Sunday Times just tells it all. There's 25.5% interest rates still being charged out there three years after your government became, uh, came to office when you said you were going to bring interest rates down. The your Minister, of Finance, be, Prime your Minister of Finance has never been Can right. Come in here. The unfair thing does seem to be that it, it's not the people paying these high mortgage rates uh, who set up the protected economy in the first place. Indeed, it was your political forebears who did. Yet it is the people paying 19 to 25 percent who think, are paying the price. I, I think that there is an awful price which has been paid. I think that that price has been borne first and hardest in the region and longest. I think that farmers had a terrible thing happen. They lost about half the value of the land and their mortgages went up. But you know, farmers aren't stupid. When they met Mr Bolger last week, they urged him not to go back to subsidies because they knew they couldn't farm to a subsidy. And they said to Why Mr did Bolger... did you introduce one last week? They said to Mr Bolger, week. don't farm for subsidies. Give us a viable economic base. Correct. And you and introduced Mr. Bolger is the week. person who told Gordon McLaughlin that when he was under Secretary of Agriculture, his introduction of SMPs was the crowning achievement of his career. And in 1987, he's not born again. In he's 19, just about to be... In uh, 1984, the then National Party, in fact, stopped SMPs. And you know that, Prime Minister. You should tell the truth just they occasionally. They did not stop SMPs. SMPs, SMPs had been stopped before no, the change of government. And you correct. know that, that to be true. Not correct. That is true. Farmers do not want to go back to subsidies, neither do manufacturers. They want an economy where they're not crucified by record interest rates right. and overvalued exchange rates. Let's tell us how you're going to That's do it. That's what the farmers want. They Just don't want you to do a U-turn as you did this week <laughs> and turn right around but and offer a $25 a time subsidy. This the big chance of the campaign. You wanted a debate. You wanted to put forward the Correct. positive National Party thing. That's right. We're about, what, 20 minutes into it? and not one bit of policy. Well, I've been trying to get you to argue the issues of your credibility well, party. I'm the happy. Issues. The first issue we will get into is to yeah. stop the Reserve Bank on your instructions holding interest well, rates up. As you know, that's not correct. That is true, and no. the Reserve Bank has admitted they're holding interest rates no. up on your instructions. Right, that's, that's a big We will policy. also reduce the size of the state and therefore the demands of the state and on the New Zealand that? dollar. That's how going to involve that? a lot of pain as well. You're well, talking let's about just, $500 let's million just, spending Let's gaps. just look at where the money is going in the that's state. that the pain yeah. has let's, been unnecessary and that some will suddenly ease. You've asked no, for some I answers. I want to know where you're going to cut a billion dollars before Christmas. Well, your Prime Minister, your Minister of Finance rather, said last year he'd chopped off $842 million no, but, but without don't worry about trying. Roger. Roger's proving that he can do things. I want you to tell the well, country I should hope that where we you're going to get a $1,000 million cuts by Christmas. It's not difficult. We've oh, got a difficult. government's administration which has grown in three years yeah. from $900 million yes. costing to $2,000 million. Yep. Are you against you law and order? Because you have put a thousand extra tax gatherers in for a start. Are you going to cut system. law and order? No, we're going to spend more on law and order. And you order. know that. Are Prime you going to spend more on we're going to, however, We're going to, however, get out of the system all those political appointees yeah. that you have put in the beehive. Uh -huh. You've stuck yeah. a whole lot of those into the beehive, And what about Prime the Minister of Transport? Are you going to cut them back? No, we're not going no. to conduct... Con, uh, well, Mr Perigo, can I tell no, the Leader of the Opposition to, something? Let me just carry on a stage. The Leader of the, the Opposition says, says we, yeah. no, where are the where cuts, are the cuts coming made? from? Well, I've just been going through them. If the yeah. Prime Minister could be calm for a moment, yeah. and I'll just remind him again yeah. that his Minister claimed he got $842 million out, and we can certainly, with a, a more positive approach, get more than a billion dollars out. We aim to out get a billion out of the whole of the government's administration, right. which, is, right. which is something over $22 billion annually. Right. Now, something Perry, over $22 billion annually goes to state. What you're showing, Prime Minister, is you believe the state will continue to grow. We are going to privatise. We're going to privatise so we can reduce. You're going to privatise the health service. I know. No, that. we're not. That's your policy. No, you said a corporate That's structure to compete in a business environment. That's Ooh. the National Party policy, Mr. Perigo. Mr. Boulder has said that he's going to cut a thousand million off administration. That's which a is too lie, big. and I did not say oh, that. Oh, Mr. Cox said it in front of you, and you agreed That's with him. That's a lie, and he did not say well, that. The public can judge that, but I tell you this: he's pledged not to reduce law and order. He's pledged not to reduce the Ministry of Transport. Of the $2,000 million in government administration, 
1,570 million of those are law and order and transport. That's news to Mr Bolger. Now, the fact is, he also is going to cut the budget back by cutting back on people in the Beehive. Mr Cox said 150 contract staff in the Beehive will be sacked. Does the minister, does the leader uh, uphold that? Well, there's a whole lot of political appointees yeah. running your image-making. Right. There are 23 <laughs> contract people in the Beehive. You can't do your sums. Isn't it a fact that the only about the only economic indicator looking any good at the moment is the balance of payments deficit and the reason that's looking a lot no, better two, two, is increased fuel self-sufficiency as a result no, of no, thinking. No, not correct. There's more things to it than that because we've had that self-sufficiency for a while. Uh, the fact is that uh, we have traded better, the volume of exports is better for the first time for years we've got a merchandise surplus. All these people wander around saying exports are down, volume's down. The they facts are. don't Look, of we've had a 4.6% increase in GDP since we became the government, which is more than the National Party had in the whole three years. That's quite incorrect. The volume of manufactured exports is down. The volume oh, of manufactured of, exports. Yeah, the volume of manufactured is down. The volume of agricultural-based exports is going up That's a little right. because farmers are slaughtering their herds right. because they can't put on fertilizer. And the balance of payments is improving because there's been a million and a third tons less fertilizer come on. And that, of course, means the farmers are selling off their livestock. Yes, that'll give you a short term. But over the three years of your government, Mr. Prime Minister, there has been an annual balance of payments deficit, cumulatively, of about $9 billion. Don't talk about surpluses. We are having a $3 billion deficit on invisibles this year. A small surplus on trade. Overall, we'll have about a $2.5 billion we go again. deficit. Let me go again. Gentlemen. The Thank person you. who is going to give policy refuses to give policy. I'm right. debating let's the issues. <laughs> We've got let's, an 80 let's page on manifesto on now, policy, Mr. Prime Minister. Please. You've got 27 pages of Hold dribble. It. Next issue. <laughs> and at the technical points of economic matters may seem remote to many voters, 84,000 New Zealanders are painfully aware of the problems they face. They are the unemployed, 84,000 of them. And that's a figure both sides in this debate agree will rise. The question is by how much and what to do about it. Mr Longy first. Well, the fact is that unemployment is actually, with special work, lower than it was in January 1984. It's about the same as it was in July 1984. It peaked, actually, in January 84 at 131,712. Now, it's going to average for the year about 91,000, which is why there was the provision in the budget for a 23% increase. How do you address that? Unemployment is the worst thing that can happen to a young person wanting to get ahead. It's a tragedy for someone who's older and having to get into a job late in life because there is not a huge premium demand for such people. And our answer to that is not to have people shuffling around on make-work schemes. Our answer to that is to have skills training programs which will maximise the chances for those people to get jobs. There are now 17,000 people well, let's come on, one on those facts. access training programmes. Let's come to one or two of the facts. It sounded good, Prime Minister, but the facts are the last year of the national government, there was an additional 21,000 full-time jobs created at a time when there were 6,500 New Zealanders returned to this country. The last year of your government just completed 24,000 full-time jobs lost and 14,000 New Zealanders left the country. That's the last 12 months of the two administrations. How are you going to make when a job? your policies have shown through into reality in the job market. There's been 24,000 full-time jobs lost, Prime Minister, and 14,000 New Zealanders left the country. You talk about giving them training. I went into your own electorate and saw a Salvation Army training scheme there for young New Zealanders who had been on the dole and out of work. And you are stopping the funding of that scheme and putting those kids back on the road. No, it's no. the most cruel, heartless thing I have mm. seen. That is because the that's happening. That's the that the is happening. It's not gone, the criticism, it's the truth. The training program that has mm. taken I was place there. cannot I mean, accommodate I, I everyone who wants to go on and it doesn't guarantee a job. Mr Bolger had another go and hasn't said a thing for the future. I let's, was let's there. Right well, let's talk about that training program. No, let's talk about the future. I thought Mr Pitt, I mean, if we're going to have... Just imagine three years of that. Just, let's Can you talk just about imagine that. three years of that? Just talk about nothing the future. New, the nothing new, nothing positive. Let's talk sure about the future. The, future. the so policy of the National both. Party. Perhaps, perhaps Mr Perigo, if it's possible to be able to speak in this programme. The Prime Minister well, was, quite well. was going to talk about the access yeah. programme. I think, think we should give him the chance. Access programmes are going to be judged by the same criteria as Mr Bolger wants to judge educational programmes. Efficient ones, which are cost effective, are going to continue. That will be on the judgment of local committees, not by government. And there are some that won't continue. And there is a great 
feel invested in some of these schemes by certain organizations, the voluntary agencies, and the Salvation Army. The funny thing is that when Mr. Bolger went after his photo opportunity in Mangani, he went to a place who was so concerned about it that they hadn't even got in touch with their local member of parliament. But oh, it was a good view. That's your sure. sure. so <laughs> problem. What we've got here, let's talk yeah. about the future. What we're saying to mm. New Zealanders, it is totally wrong to pay 66,000 New Zealanders to do nothing, which is what Mr Longy's government is doing, and then we, we want them in either training programs or in work. Exactly. That if you have high unemployment, 66,000 people out on the street, you are inevitably going to get more crime. No use being excited about crime growing if you're going to just throw people onto the scrap heap of unemployment. That's why our commitment is no work, no doll. We're going to provide no, training. Not, we're going to provide training. You we're said going there would to, be a doll. We're going to provide training. We're going to provide work after a period if that's not possible. We simply reject the concept of just pouring hundreds of millions of dollars down the drain to pay people to do nothing you, because it is destructive to the people concerned. You know, you have you to be concerned. To finally, when he you said have no to, work, no you doll. have to, you have you to be concerned be about the people involved. The government has shown, even in the Prime Minister's own electorate, a scheme he's never visited, he's already admitted. I have been. They there. are stopping a scheme run by the Salvation Army. Are you saying the Salvation Army are ripping the system off or something, not doing it properly? Is that your suggestion, Prime Minister? I'm, I'm asking you to tell one word to New Zealand of what you've changed. Just one word. What we've and changed. And not say no work, no doll, because you said on television when what, Mr. Burke said that, no, we would have the doll as what well. What we said we're changing <laughs> is we're not spending the billion dollars that is going to be spent this year on training and doll in the fashion of the Labour Party, which is putting 66,000 New Zealanders out there getting paid to do nothing. We're going to stop that. We're going to give them the opportunity of some worthwhile training or some worthwhile employment. Well, because that that doesn't guarantee no, people doesn't. jobs. That's no, the doesn't. problem with it, isn't it? And the trouble with Mr Bolger is that he guarantees anyone that's in front of him anything. The rest well, of theory, the, the, rest of theory of the other day in Otara was guaranteed a job. He was he guaranteed there'd be training schemes, Prime Minister. Ah, so well, tell the I, truth. I, well I, I guarantee there'd be training schemes. No, but you're not. You're, but stopping, you, that, you're stopping that the one also. Is, if, I could, if I could that say to you, Mr Perigo... One at a time, please. The sort is, it out. The fact is that unemployment is a scourge. We have elected to prepare people for work, and we have an economic for policy which will, is designed to procure growth. And we have been upfront about it. We have been open and straightforward. We have... Look, he says no work, no doll. If people refuse work or training, no, they don't get the doll. That's the simple fact. And when Mr Burt says no work, no doll, and when Mr Bolger says, oh, there will be overlaps and some people will be on the doll, it rather tends to blow their credibility again. And when no. he promises to use the doll money saved to fund regional development suspensory loans, remedial reading programs, and a great deal of the educational expenditure, everyone knows they've just that, got to be that's joking. That's your imagination, Prime Minister. <laughs> you, so you are Bolger trying it's your literature. to move on to... Our next section, economic policy and uh, employment policy, of course, lay the basis of social policy, education, health and welfare in particular, and in turn that raises perennial questions about the role of the state in these areas. How big a role and to what extent should social services be paid for directly by the people who use them? So let's turn to social policy now. Position statement first from, I think it's your turn, Mr Bolter. Well, happy to do that. In terms of education, of course, we want to make sure that there is choice and therefore we want to maintain a private sector education system as well as the state and, of course, there's the third group, which is the integrated schools. We see them all having a positive role. We're going to therefore maintain funding on a realistic basis, lift up the subsidy again to 50% for the private school oh, teachers, 50% uh, for the private school teachers, as, is, as was there before. The government's reduced that to 30%. Uh, we also believe in the health area, that there should be complementary systems, both state and private, and uh, we're not moving into a user-pay system for state health as the government proposes. We think that's quite wrong, and uh, we will oppose that. The Prime Minister says rubbish. It's in his secret agenda. It's announced by his Minister of Health, okay. so uh, he can't deny that. In terms of welfare, the real, the real challenge there, of course, is to have an economy that produces the jobs we're talking about and then you reduce that massive unemployment. You require economic growth to do that. We also have a big problem with the growth in the number of people on a domestic purposes benefit. Increased 16,000 in the last three years. We're saying, of course, a lot of those require it. But we're going to allocate the domestic purposes benefit on a case-by-case -case basis rather than just a blanket cover. All right, right. thank you, Mr. Perigo, for that. Can I say to you that the uh, stand of the government on education is abundantly plain. We are the education party. We're the ones that pioneered the entitlement for people to do it, and we're going to ensure 
that it carries on. What, a, what appearance one for their kids, and this government is going to see that it happens. They want a good start before primary school. They want a preschool educational environment. Then they need to get stuck into that primary school so that basic literacy is addressed. We've increased the number of remedial reading school programs from 440 to 906. We've put new extra teachers in the junior school. We would have put more if the previous government hadn't slashed teacher training intakes. In the secondary school, we're seeing that we have challenges in education so that people aren't culled out of it. And the basis of all of that, our opponents have one education strategy, subsidy for the private. That's quite Choice untrue. Choice for the wealthy. And, and it was articulated to, tonight by Mr. Bolger. In are, health, we, are, we have an absolute assurance that you cannot have user pays in health. The allegations which have been made are just nonsense. Oh, the fact Dr. is... Dr Bassett said so. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. He did not. And the fact is that the National Party are going to corporatise the hospital system. They have said so, and they will operate, as the National Party manifesto says, in a competitive business environment. And therein lies the whole problem well, for the just, National Party. Let's just they say Rogernomics is so disastrous that we've got to go further and faster. Let's and they say that Muldoon's economic management was so good that we didn't go back to it. Right, let's, just throw, to let's just throw question. out the question mm. of corporatisation. The only government, the only party that's talking about corporatisation of the health system is the Labour Party. And your manifesto. Is the Labour Party. And uh, that's and been announced by the Mr. Minister. Bolger. Look, you got offside with your Minister of Health. Don't let's try and get it. Everybody saw you having an argument with him. Let's pick up the education question, though. We have announced a comprehensive reform of the total education system. The government know that and they're trying to get back on side. We want standards in there. We want the children when they come out, the young New Zealanders when they come out, to know they've got a piece of paper that's worth something rather than some woolly piece of nonsense that can get, they can get at the present time. Your campaign we also <laughs> talks about a generation of illiterates. Where are all of these illiterates? Where do they well, come they, from? Are, they are ending up in some of these unemployed groups going into remedial reading classes as I was visiting and, in and the Prime the Minister's government election. For three years. Where did that illiteracy well, come from? Well, I want to look forward, Prime Minister, in terms of what New Zealand's education must be between uh, now and the end of the so century. To do with you. If you want to no. look back, that's fine. <laughs> that's why we've invested a lot of time and effort into producing a manifesto and a commitment in education that is positive and takes New Zealand and forward. And has 24 because, spelling mistakes in it. Because we reject what's happening for young New Zealanders at the present. They are simply not getting a relevant education for the jobs that are going to be there tomorrow, much less today. We are still having too many fail in the education system. There are too many who come out that can't read, that lack basic numeracy skills. And there is no reason to perpetuate that. And we are saying, look, give the good teachers in the system the syllabus and the structure that will enable them to carry out and their you know work. This in a the relevance that upsets the many parents, is isn't it? Peace studies, Tahamari right. and so on. They but say that's not grossly relevant exaggerated to the and seized on. In fact, that curriculum review met, they decided that those were appropriate social adjuncts. And Ruth Richardson wrote to every member of the, of the review committee saying what a marvellous job they've done. For political purposes now it becomes a matter of prejudice. We're used to that. But the fundamentals are here. It's all very well, Mr Bolger, talking about people who don't learn and read and write. But if there are no teachers, they don't. And we put the teachers back into the classrooms. They took them out. You've got they... to put resources back into preschool education. We put them in into childcare. They think it's some sort of great socialistic plot to have preschool education Well, that's childhood. untrue. Again, you, you're persisting <laughs> in this, this line of untruth, Prime Minister. In fact, the whole of the development of preschool occurred before you became Prime Minister. I'm sure you can recall that, including the whole of the Māori preschool program, which now is something like uh, ten or 14,000 young Māoris in. So you're, you're simply distorting the facts once more. Isn't the thing that parents want, above all, choice and yep, quality? Right. Won't national zoning proposal give them a lot more yep, choice than they have now? Give them a lot more choice, the ones with money. Definitely. You've got give, money, give you can migrate to the Auckland Grammar Zone. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I think that that's what they've always done. They've give, always used disadvantage as an excuse to suck up the privilege. Well, so the interesting thing, that. the Prime Minister talks about that, but he's now far more comfortable with his new millionaire friends that can do whatever they wish Which for their education. Friends, uh, he, have, he, knows, uh, he knows precisely that. And in fact, he's been ignored. He's ignored. Mine. <laughs> the disadvantage in society, just as he ignored those kids in his own electorate and is going to put them out on the street. He's ignoring those who are failing in the system at the present time. We are saying, look, we want all young New Zealanders to get a training option when they come out of secondary school. So we've put a whole new program in there to guarantee at least three years training for those who want it, whether it be in a technical institute, a university, and the cost a of training that, program, the cost of that or, a private, that came out or a private sector, or a private sector training program, or whatever. Again, we're saying let's use the hundreds of millions of dollars we're putting into ad hoc training programs like the Access Scheme 
and the hundreds of millions of dollars we're spending on unemployment benefits for people to do nothing constructively. See, New Zealand is spending a vast sum of money in this area. We're not doing it on the cheap. We're not saving money by doing it wrong. We're saying, look, the taxpayer is fronting up. Let's use that money constructively by putting in place training programs that meet the needs of New Zealanders. Come we back have to zoning. Passed, Come back to we zoning. have passed the stage. Zoning. Let's finish this for a moment. Let's finish this for a moment. We have passed the stage. We have passed the stage where youngsters can come out of school without qualifications and find a job, and we want, in fact, to give them some qualifications. Zoning. Yes, zoning. Happy to uh, say that we're going to get rid of zoning. We believe it is an unnecessary constraint on people choosing which school to go to. There are far more zones around New Zealand than Auckland Grammar. You may have a hang-up on Auckland Grammar, but there are zones in many towns and cities that are unnecessary. If the parents take their children or want to take their children to a school which has now got some zone limit, it implies very, very obviously that the type of education being delivered by that school is what the parents want. Why don't we give the parents a little choice as to the type of education they want for their All right, children. Two that's policies why, for this election, to subsidise private school teachers 50% and to give the rich the boost of migrating to, anywhere in New no, Zealand. No, the rest will have the choice right. as well. <laughs> but you're denying New Zealand parents the right to have a say in the education programme. Okay? I want parents who are the prime group involved and interested on behalf of their children to have a say. Come to social welfare, I think probably the one topic we have time to discuss is superannuation. The surtax, of course, Prime Minister, has attracted a great deal of odium in part because it's deemed to represent a broken promise. Will that surtax stay? Yes, it will. The fact is that the national superannuation, and I talked about my failure to get something across. My failure to get something across was a very simple failure. National superannuation is the entitlement of a New Zealander at the age of 60. If they have a lot of extra money... Well, it isn't any longer no, as a result is. of the surtax, is it? Listen to me. It is. Because if they have a lot of extra money, that is taken away by tax. But they know this much, that if their income falls, they are guaranteed national superannuation. And 3% of New Zealand national superannuitants have the equivalent of all of their national superannuation gone. Another 17% lose part of it, and the overwhelming four-fifths of superannuitants are better off. I was at a meeting last night where a very old man travelled a long way he was a former National Party supporter and he came to that meeting to tell me that he couldn't bear the National Party weeping crocodile tears for people in need of social welfare because he remembered in the course of his life when they used to despise beneficiaries. Well, and now they're selective. They support well, the plus 60s with a lot of extra money. Can we just make the, the very simple point that the Prime Minister not only stated many times in the last election that he wouldn't alter national superannuation, he wrote to every superannuitant and told them he wouldn't uh, alter national super, uh, superannuation. Well, we did. Now, we now, now, in fact, he's trying to get off the hook of his uh, backtrack on that, his dishonouring of his commitment by his government introducing national superannuation surtax. It is wrong and it must go because it discriminates against those who have made some effort in their own life to provide for themselves. And we've said that must go, and it will go. And there's no way the Prime Minister can restore his credibility by now attacking a few that he says are disadvantaged because of it. Can I make another point? That his own statistics department show that rather than superannuitants as a group being better off in 1987 than 1984, they are the group most significantly disadvantaged in real disposable income terms and that's the statistics department figures, not mine. And you propose to phase in 65 as we the age propose, in fact, he proposed to take it we, off them We propose <laughs> because there is a, a growing percentage of the uh, population that will be over the age of 60. It has to be capable of being funded, superannuation. And what we propose to do over a 20-year period, gradually increase the age at which a person becomes entitled to national superannu superannuation to age 65. We've set that out in detail in our policy. It will be carried out. For those who have no other source of income between ages 60 and 65, there will be a welfare or a superannuation payment, but it will be means tested. We do not expect that there will be a particularly large number on that. It is a progressive policy designed to reflect the changing demographic structure in the New Zealand population. Fair enough, well, given that it's a, a affordability is the problem. Awful lot of words there. Uh, the fact is that even the National Party tonight has admitted that the 75 scheme isn't affordable. Now, we have the guts to challenge it. We did it. We dealt with it. We didn't like it. Do you think I like superannuitants waving their umbrellas at me? But the fact is that we did it. 
Now, what Mr. Bolger does is he gets in front of the pensioners and he says, you can have what you want. He went to Federated Farmers and he said, tell me what you want. He goes everywhere and he's like some you sort of itinerant masseur. On me on this, he massages politically to, erogenous zones you, all around you, New Zealand. You, you want he's to he's me, worried about fine. the rich, so he's going to scrub this duty. But we're straying off the point. But how about excuse dealing me, with excuse the superannuation? Excuse me, excuse yeah. me. Next section. Yeah. And social policy, as we've seen, involves questions of equal access, equal opportunity. And one of the charges against current government policy is that it has accentuated inequalities between rich and poor. You've heard Mr. Bolger say that, and Māori and Pākehā in particular. It is argued that the ruthless, competitive world of the free market runs contrary to Māori values and is forcing more and more Māori onto the economic scrappy. And so we move to Māori issues now with a position statement first from the Prime Minister. What we have in 1987 is a Māori renaissance which this government is grappling with and it's grappling with it in the concepts of a partnership. There are certain very basic things which you have to remember that from here on in it is not the question of government patronising Māori people. It is a question of Māori people unlocking their own resources, using their own skills, and with the devolution of administration onto their authorities, seeing that there is real hope for Māori people. The old system of dependency and patronage put a terrible, dank hand on Māori aspiration. And this government has wrestled with this issue like no other. We enshrined in the state-owned enterprises bill the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. The outcome of the court action by the Māori Council is to have the government and the Māori Council working to address those grievances. Māori people aren't asking for handouts. They're not going to get handouts. But they are asking for an interaction and a respect, and this government is determined to give that to them. Yeah, our 30 seconds is getting longer. The, and longer. That's right. The Maori, people, the Maori people, first of all, would want an economy that produces jobs for the young people because they are the most disadvantaged by an economy that's not producing work because they're overwhelmingly overrepresented in the unemployed statistics. They also want an education system that provides them with the ability to acquire skills in that system and go out with some qualifications because, again, they're failing or the system is failing them in that area. And what we're saying is, no, paternalism is out, that Māoris must be given the opportunity of developing their own resources and using their own initiative, of which they're more than capable of doing, but we cannot see that being achieved unless, of course, you get an economy that provides them with others the opportunity to grow. There has been, and I agree with the Prime Minister on one thing, there has been a uh, renaissance in Māori spirit there is a, now an acceptance within Māoridom that they can't look to the state as they may have in the past. That I readily accept. And there is also, I believe, a growing acceptance in New Zealand that there are two major cultures in this country, but we have to live in the same land, or as I've put it in speeches, in the same house. And yet isn't and it that, true that we're becoming increasingly separatist and, in our attitudes and, on both sides? Well, that's the point I'm going to do. Unfortunately, there are those who seek to divide us on racial grounds, and as, as pressures, social pressures, economic pressures come on, it's always easy to blame the other fellow. And if the skin is a slightly different colour, it's easier still. And that's what we must stop. And that's where I have to say I disagree entirely with the Labour Party. Uh, and uh, in this proposal to increase does this, the does number this like you to stop shortly? in this in the number of new Maori seats they want to put in, I think that would be a giant step backwards if we were to increase representation in Parliament on racial grounds. All right, Prime Minister. <laughs> uh, the fact is, of course, that there's no proposal to do anything of the sort. There should be fairness in representation. If the numbers warrant it, there will be. Uh, no other proposal, no other agenda. I, I'd like to say to Mr. Bolger, I think that what he has said with respect to the race issue uh, does him credit. Uh, it is something which is not consistent within his party, but it is at least obvious that he has, uh, as a person, tried to be responsible and moderate in that regard, and that, I think, is probably a reflection of where he comes from <laughs> and the place in which he grew up, and I'm glad of that. I think the future is going to be difficult. I think that the problems that you get of simple uneasiness enhance the problem of the conflict. The natural unawareness of the Pākehā and the Marae is probably only to be contrasted with the natural unease of a young Māori school pupil who came to the Beehive during Parliament Week. The two clashes don't help, and sometimes people take that out in resentment and misunderstanding.
All right, well, the one area where it seems generally agreed that Māori people are very well represented uh, is imprisonment. And many voters in this election are looking at the whole question of prison and prison sentences against a background of much publicised incidents of sexual abuse, child murder, rape and other vicious crimes of violence, there is a feeling abroad that the prison system is too soft and that even the reintroduction of hanging is in order. So, law and order, our subject now. Position statement first from Mr Bolger. Well, first of all, to uh, deal with the upsurge in crime, we must go back to the roots. And I touched earlier, and I won't spend long on it now, if you have massive unemployment, you're going to inevitably have more crime. That's an inevitable fact of massive unemployment, so the economy features in this area of the debate also. When there are, when crime is committed, though, the uh, law must be, s as far as possible, certain. In other words, they will be apprehended. We have committed ourselves to additional resources to the police. Any reasonable request we receive from the police, obviously per medium of the commissioner, we will respond to. The penalties available to the courts must be adequate, and we've identified in amendments to laws in Parliament that the government, the Labour Party oppose, that we would want some of them increased and increased substantially. And we identified in particular a maximum of up to 20 years for rape. So the laws must be adequate, the judiciary must be prepared to use the laws that Parliament provides it with, and there is a belief in the community that despite quite severe penalties available to the courts, the courts are too reluctant to use them, and I believe that is a concern that has basis. Position well, statement, Prime Minister. The simple fact is that for nine years they let crime rip unmolested. We have made 20 separate increases in penalty, and in nine years the National Party passed one minor amendment to the Arms Act. In the last three years, they put on 173 extra police officers. We've put on 388. We've completely rejuvenated the front line of the police force by early retirement. And we are continuing with the policy of encouraging neighbourhood support with a huge increase in that. We have increased the penalties. Geoffrey Palmer on the television the other night talking about locking the dangerous, violent person up and throwing the key away. That's what preventive detention is about. Yet how credible no, is the stance no, that, that you're taken, given that less than a year ago your Minister of Justice was citing studies showing that increased penalties tended to increase the chances of reoffending. He clearly yeah, but was not in favour of that. No, I know, but that's, you don't get reoffending if you're locked up. But you've the got simple, this if, if I could answer Mr Perrigan's well, question. It's just bandwagon jumping, isn't it? Though? No, it isn't. It's There's had a concern an abroad, so you'll address it. No, no. Can I say to you that it has been effective and that Roper Commission had more than just the top end of the scale. We are moving in the whole area. People out there know that it's a complex issue. People out there know that it's not just a question of saying flog them or hang them. It's a matter of making sure that dangerous, violent people don't wander free. And then it's a matter of getting right from the basis of early childhood a learning experience which says that you don't have to punch someone in the head to get your own way. But a lot of people don't learn that and they do punch people well, in the head. Well then they've got to be locked This is the problem uh, that the, <laughs> but this is where the public Jeffrey, perceives, isn't this it? Is the, where the, the government and an army of psychologists and sociologists mm. and so on are, are ready to make excuses for no, the criminal. No, they're, they're, they're ready to lock them up for long lie. periods. No. And I can tell you this, that if you want to know where sympathies lie, wherein lies the sympathy between the government which imposed those extra penalties in great number and our predecessors who imposed one minor amendment no, to the, 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 the real fact is, of course, Geoffrey Palmer's first initiative was to permit the courts to release prisoners early. That was Geoffrey Palmer's first initiative. He then received 10,000 10, clip-outs from the Christchurch press and he decided there was a problem in the community, so he started to get a tougher stance. But Geoffrey Palmer, as Minister of Justice, has closed the prison down in my electorate because it's too cold and the prisoners would be too far away from mum. Now, well, let's come back that, to that. That was a medium open security prison. If Mr Bolger wanted no, violent mayhem criminals no, in there, we weren't he must talking be about violent tree. mayhem criminals here. We're just talking about the soft approach of Geoffrey Palmer. Uh, in the last few months, of course, he's now with the sophisticated polling conducted by an Australian firm for the Labour Party. They have identified, of course, law and order as a major political issue. So they charge into Parliament with a, with a piece of legislation to toughen the law so that the Prime Minister can come here at night and say, look, we're very tough. But if you follow the track record of the Labour Party, it's quite the reverse. Right. I mean, well, there's chap, proposing, there's proposing, chap, yeah, there's chap proposing, holding, there's me, chap holding that murder, that little in, Indian girl was yeah. let out of prison during the term of the Labour Party. You're proposing to toughen up to the point of contemplating the reintroduction of hanging, holding a referendum on it 
in fact. What we've Isn't said, that bandwagon do you support, jumping? Do you support what hanging? we've said, I'll answer that for you in a moment. I'll answer Lindsay first. He's the mm -hmm. interviewer. What, uh, what we've said is that the issue of capital punishment has been around for many years and it's debated on many occasions. And uh, given the intensity of the debate on violent crime, and particularly some of the more horrendous murders, that we believed as a caucus that the public, not only the parliamentarians, should have the opportunity of expressing a viewpoint on what it. What is your viewpoint? My viewpoint has always been against capital punishment. I've said time and again that I'm instinctively still against capital punishment. That's my instinctive reaction. But I must say that given the brutality, the sadistic nature of some murders now, one has to even question you that. see, I come back to that as an indication of credibility. The, the policy came out and they bandwagoned and they flip-flopped and they said, well, let the public express through a referendum their outrage. And then he said to the public, and I will in no way be bound by your view. Correct, I did say and to... And he promised up to $20 million extra on law enforcement, and 15 million of that would go on the referendum. No, it would not go on the referendum. That's, that's, <laughs> of course that's, it that's would. a different issue, oh, a different in terms of cost. Uh, in terms of the public, I did say they would have a view, but I did say that I would not require members to vote against their okay. conscience on this issue, it's and I will not, Prime Minister, I don't know about you. What so, is the point uh, of holding a referendum, though, if you're then going PR to subvert it with a, with a conscience? Well, point? I believe very firmly that the public having to address the issue themselves before they go into any referendum to make a decision will do the community a lot of good. Because it's very easy to get angry and say, look, let's, uh, let's hang them or let's birch them or whatever, without having to think through whether that, in fact, is really what you want to happen in this country. Or whether you do want greater use of preventive detention where, in fact, they will be locked up for a very, very long time. And that's what we've done. And we move finally in this debate from protection against the criminal at home to protection of New Zealand, defence and foreign policy. Here, of course, the two big issues have been the government's nuclear-free policy and the effect of that policy on ANZUS. Prime Minister first. This country determined in 1984 that it would be nuclear-free. This government has always honoured that, and we have been through a very long series of negotiations, and we have always said that the security of New Zealand is enhanced if we are nuclear-free, and that meant that we had to look at our conventional defensive strategy. We discovered we had two days ammunition. We spent $30 million to get some ammunition. We decided, unlike the previous government, that, that soldiers should have rifles. We've ordered 18,000 of them. We've decided that four frigates should be able to go somewhere. So for the first time, we got a tanker and a tug. We're getting a logistic support vessel. We bought another Orion for maritime surveillance. We are actually giving the Skyhawks the capacity to fly with new avionics. We put money into defense and we put principle into our foreign policy. And we were told, and why have we done that? We knew that if we had visits from United States vessels, they would, on the word of the US, be from time to time nuclear armed. And we have said no. New as Zealand, simple as that. New Zealand declared itself to be a non-nuclear nation long before the Prime Minister. It was in 1963 when we agreed with the UN Treaty of Non-Proliferation. We ratified that, or Keith Holyoke as Prime Minister, ratified that treaty on New Zealand's behalf in 1969. And that required us not to manufacture, store or use nuclear weapons. So it's way back in the 60s that New Zealand adopted a nuclear-free position and that still persists. What has happened in the meantime, however, is that this Labour government has decided it will not accept the neither confirmed nor denied basis of the British and the US Defence Departments, except as it relates to military aircraft, where the Prime Minister amended his own law to accept the neither confirmed nor denied basis on that issue. We have said, in fact, we will accept the neither confirmed nor denied basis. We don't want nuclear weapons in New Zealand. We are prepared to trust our allies. On the issue of the uh, State Department comment or the Secretary of State's comment, I said earlier that that statement has been rebutted during the course of this election campaign. They have said that the statement by the Prime Minister of New Zealand is not in accordance with the facts. You have in terms, terms, in terms, no, just a moment. They said nothing of the sort. I was there and it was said to me. It, it was evidenced the, by the, the Secretary State, of Foreign Affairs. The State Department has said you that it's not, it's not in accordance it. with the facts. And I even brought it down here if you really want to yeah. know it. It has right. been said. It has been refuted by the State Department as not in keeping with the facts. I said accordance, well, I'll change that word, yeah. as not in keeping with the facts, and that was said only a few days ago. So, Mr. Prime Minister, your statement has been questioned, in fact, not questioned, it has been thrown no, out been by the State Department. Isn't in fact, terms, in isn't, terms isn't of, the those that hard, of the hardware, me. can I just is, respond to the no, hardware question? No, I not just on. yet. Isn't it the case that you both want 10 bob each way in this? You want to be in ANZUS and you want to keep the country... No, let me answer that immediately. This country will be nuclear-free. 
that priority is higher than an operational capacity with the United States under ANZUS. And we are in an operational relationship with Australia under ANZUS. Now let's get that abundantly clear. This country will be nuclear free. All this nonsense about nuclear non-proliferation back in 63. Warren well, Cooper, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the last administration, said at the last election that nuclear weapons had come to New Zealand. Let's just pick up what we have lost. The Prime Minister dismisses eerily with one wave of his hands us. We've lost over 90% of our processed intelligence data. In fact, in New Zealand, he's talking about the defence capacity increasing. We have only two people now in defence intelligence in New Zealand. No wonder we didn't know what was happening oh, in two Fiji. Two people in defence intelligence. No wonder, Absolute rubbish. No wonder we didn't know you what was happening in Fiji oh, because we Mr. simply... Mr Perrigo, I protest we that. Simply, we have a whole team of people in defence intelligence. We simply don't have now the capacity <laughs> because we've been cut off. We've been cut off from the base supply of intelligence. We've lost over 90%. So we can, of course, sail around here, but let's pick up the second question, that we're allegedly more secure now. Well, I'm not sure if we're more secure why the Prime Minister of New Zealand and the Foreign Minister of Australia decided to fly through the middle of the night to gather in a shed up at Ohakia to discuss, presumably, security or related issues in this area of the world. It's because we talk to each other, Mr. Bolger, Ooh. and we have good intelligence Do sources. Can I and say you, to you that you if you panic, think... And you panic in the middle you of the think, night. I certainly didn't panic anywhere. If you think that there are actually two people in defence intelligence in New Zealand, you've got to be nuts. Yeah, well, that's your own interpretation. You should get a mirror. <laughs> Uh, usually get mirror. What we have done is to lose our capacity, so we're now, of course, having to try and build up in an inadequate way our own. See, we're now going to depend on the Australians, but the Australian Labour Party let the poor old New Zealand Labour Party down. They didn't even mention New Zealand in their defence policy. They didn't even mention New Zealand. They didn't it's say, look, we've got it. It's mentioned in a great length they, in the defence policy uh, in they the white paper. No, they said... Uh, they talked about not building in, the ocean combat on not vessels in their manifesto. Over. They spent time in the Labour Party's manifesto talking about their, their relationship with Australia has been important to well, them. Well, the United with States. Australia was Excuse important me, to, to Australia. the United States, let's but let's New Zealand was left out, Prime Minister. We have only... Mr. Bolger. Confused, Mr. We Perry have Guy. only, Mr. Bolger. you may be confused, Bolger, we have only one it. ally now, that's Australia, and they really want to ignore us. Let me come in here. Rightly or wrongly, this seems to be proving something of a vote winner for Labour in that the issue has become identified with national sovereignty of New Zealand standing on its own two feet and not being pushed around by outside powers, in this case, the United States. Can you match that? I don't believe defence or security of the realm should be a question of a vote winner or not a vote winner. That should be on the basis of what is necessary to defend New Zealand and to provide it with a realistic security basis. That's the grounds we should be developing our defence and security posture. That's what the National Party has taken as their first priority, not some populist cause that may or may not win votes. This issue is much bigger than that. It is really central to the responsibilities of any government, and that is to provide for the security of the nation and the people. And well, that's, that's what our policy Mr. is designed to Mr. do. Mr. Perigo, that's exactly what we did. What, exactly what we're going to do, which is why we have that defence review and that review and that planning and the procurement program. There's the old question: Who say saves you, us if we're invaded? Uh, well, if you want to be burned by a defence of a nuclear weapon, Doesn't you go ahead. Question. No one's going to save us against any ultimate reality. But if we don't have nuclear weapons in New Zealand, we are not therefore a target for a preemptive nuclear strike or a retaliatory nuclear strike. Now, that is the simple fact. Now, you come again to the question of ANZUS. The leader of the opposition on the 19th of July this year told the National Business Review that he would definitely have New Zealand back in ANZUS. He gave 100% assurance. On the 24th of July, five days later, he told the Evening Post that there was no assurance that New Zealand would get back to ANZUS. His yeah. second statement was correct. New Zealand will get back to Anders on the policy that I announced on behalf of the National Party. Why did you because tell that the policy, that policy is consistent with the objective of the party, that's the National Party, to get in, and I'm certainly is consistent with the the mood and the attitude of our allies who would like it's us to be back into a little bit there Anders. for the moment. Total swing from what you originally said. Let's leave it there no, for the moment. Prime Let's Minister, leave it there the for the moment, swung. gentlemen, please. Yeah. And there you have the thoughts of the leaders of the two main political parties about some of the uh, major issues confronting you, the voters, in this general election. If you're still undecided as to which, if either of the two, deserves your support, each leader will now make a final, truly uninterrupted pitch summing up and by the toss of that coin it's Mr Bolger who leads on. Well the objective of the National Party going into this election is to focus on the needs of New Zealanders to put people back into the centre of the election campaign. They have been brushed aside for the last three years as some 
A strange academic theory has been argued on the economy. You can go through every measurement of the economy and that hasn't worked. We now are massively in debt overseas. That is a burden that all New Zealanders are going to have to carry now for a long number of years. That's showing up in all sorts of social indicators. The unemployment we spoke of earlier. We want to turn that around and give people training or jobs. The health issue is related to high unemployment and stress in society. The crime issue is directly related. And as I said earlier, we must provide the police with both the resources and the law to get on top of crime in New Zealand, and our policy spells it out. But if you go back and really look at the New Zealand that we want in the future, the vision you have in the future, it must start in the education system and in the homes, because that's where young New Zealanders form their attitudes, develop their ideas, and develop their own approach to life. And that's why we underscore the importance of the family and having homes, and the importance of reforming the education system so that it does genuinely meet New Zealanders' needs as we move out of the 20th century into the 21st century. See, I, I reject the New Zealand I see about me today with a massive division between the wealthy and the less wealthy. We are told there's a million people approaching the poverty line. I reject a country divided in, in location, whether it's in the regions or the major cities, that's huge cleavage, and I reject the growing gap in New Zealand on racial grounds. See, the, the vision, the vision that I have is a New Zealand doing so much better than it's been doing in the last three years. A New Zealand that everyone can feel proud of. They, they can stand up as they stand up when their sporting teams win and say, God, it's good to be a Kiwi. It's good to be in there with a winning team rather than always, as at present, been explaining away failure, whether it's in the economic area, whether it's in the employment area, whether it's in education. Let's get our whole economy, our whole structure, our whole society back on the road and moving forward. Because I'm certain, as a New Zealander, absolutely certain, we can do so much better than we have done in the last three years. We can turn this country around again and we can go forward. That's the vision I have for New Zealand as we go into this election campaign. Let's think about people when we're talking policies. Let's not always be talking about dollars and who's made a million dollar killing on the stock market or made two million because the foreign exchange has moved from A to B. These are the sorts of things that we have to concentrate on. They are the issues that the National Party has concentrated on in a comprehensive manifesto. We're the only party produced a comprehensive manifesto covering all policy areas they deal with all the issues, we deal with all the issues, and they provide a solution to the problems New Zealand currently have. In simple terms, let's just go forward, reject the defeatism of the past, and look at the future we can have. Final summing up, Prime Minister. I think that New Zealanders have got a great opportunity on August the 15th. They've got the chance to compare two clear alternatives. The party, which is in government, which faced I can recall the events after the last election and I can assure you that what we faced then by way of economic sabotage, when the former cabinet wouldn't stand up to the former leader, where was the leader of the opposition in the interests of New Zealand then? He was silent. When the former Prime Minister refused to take the action necessary to stop New Zealand going into default on its international obligations, the person that has the vision for New Zealand didn't open his mouth or his envelope. And the fact is that this government has taken the hard decisions. If I have to be restrained in this campaign, it's because I have trouble with my temper when I hear someone who was the Minister of Labour when New Zealand had the biggest rise in unemployment in the Western world, now promising jobs to Rastafarians, because he is a latter-day convert to that philosophy. And I say to New Zealand, you have a choice, and it's a stark choice. And you can go back to that National Party cabinet and the front bench, seven of whom aren't allowed to appear in television advertisements, knowing that the eighth is calling the shots and twisting the existing leader of the opposition. Or you can come on a settled path. You know this government. You've seen where it's at. You've seen it make the change. You know that it had to handle the tough decisions, and under it all, you knew that the government cared enough for people to make the social impact adjustments that were necessary, and we did it. And this government led New Zealand not into the groveling around the international capitals, not bootlicking 
not going around saying we'll do anything you want, but we made our way on international markets and we competed and we grew in volume and value of export and we saw people change. Now you can stop now and you can put the clock back or on the 15th of August you can support a Labour government. Tonight what do we have from National? 50% subsidy for private school teachers, zoning abolition in education and a promise of training for three years for everyone currently out of a job. No idea of where the funding was come from, but visions are useless without the guts and the detail to go behind them. And we've seen in our opponents neither. Thank you, gentlemen. And that wraps it up for this leaders' debate between the Prime Minister, David Longy, and the leader of the opposition, Jim Bolger. Next week, they'll be joined by Democratic Party leader Neil Morrison, and all three will be answering questions sent in by viewers. Until then, good night.